Well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, happy Wednesday to everybody out there. Um, it's just one o'clock now, um, Eastern time in the U.S., so uh, we'll go ahead and get started so we can have enough time here to uh, get through all the topics and uh, have some time at the end for some questions. Um, so uh, again, welcome to uh, this topic today for designing a conference room part two. So um, this is a, kind of a split webinar where we started with part one back in November and we tried to uh, cover some topics related to um, the design and kind of best practices on the design of the DSP portion and the room on uh, designing a conference room. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with this part two and we'll just do a quick bit of housekeeping here. I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay and I'm not um, coming in too too strong on my on my microphone. I'm seeing some good levels here so I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. We're shooting for about an hour, hopefully a little under an hour so we can leave some time for questions at the end. And um, again, if there's um, questions, we'll, we'll take them along the way and I'll probably try to answer them at the end unless it pertains to anything specific that I need to um, hit right there while I'm on that topic. So um, what I'll try to do is, is kind of gather everything and, and then get you an answer to your question, read them out loud if, uh, and then get an answer. And then anyone that I can't get to or if it's something I need to research and get back to you, I'll get back to you uh, via an email and kind of send out a group uh, email to things. So again, um, you can send your questions uh, privately and uh, I will answer as needed. A uh, quick uh, introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Brent Bowman. Um, glad to have you here. Um, I'm remote based. Um, I'm part of the US um, team here on the application engineering team um, based out of the East Coast. Um, and I've been at Byatt for about two years. So I um, wanted to say thanks for coming again and uh, remind you that our um, Presentation today will be in the handout section. There'll be a PDF copy of the handout um, and also a quick uh, gain structure, kind of a white paper that I've included in there as well. Um, we'll record um, this as well as uh, part one as be, has been recorded. You'll be able to go back and um, get a uh, reminder email in a, in a week or so. And it'll give you a link to that. That'll be posted once it's finished up um, to our buy-up. YouTube channel so you'll be able to watch this in part one if you need to go back and review part one or if you miss part one. So um, that will be available. So just a quick review over what um, what we talked about first time around uh, back in November. We kind of focused more on the room acoustics um, and everything that's outside of the DSP. So we kind of talked about some best practices on room, room acoustics, microphone selection and placement, um, speaker coverage patterns, um, what to plan for in that amplification. Uh, and then we just did some quick basic calculations, um, top level view of the calculations for some speaker coverage, amplifier power, and some PAGNAG equations to uh, calculate system stability. And we kind of flew through those topics pretty quick um, because of time. And a lot of those topics are uh, deep dive kind of objects in themselves. So um, if you want to go back through there, part one is available. Uh, so today we're going to kind of focus more on the DSP things um, side of things and um, see what we can do inside of the DSP to maximize the room performance. So if we've started with a good room um, design from the aspect of all of our acoustics and planning, then uh, we can look at what we need to do in the DSP to kind of get the most out of that. So obviously the DSP's job is to maximize and optimize the audio system performance from what we start with. So probably the first first topic to kind of talk about is uh, the gain structure. So um, maybe the most important part of everything related to um, the signal chain would be the gain structure. Um, kind of in my mind fits right on the level of the room acoustics. If you've got a bad room acoustics and you have bad gain structure overall, everything's going to be a problem. Um, so gain structure that's a part that you're going to have to touch at any at any point in the chain. Um, you know, even if you're going off of a design that's been built for you and a and and then given to you, there's always going to be some on-site gain structuring that needs to be done once the system is deployed. So that's a huge part. Um, then we'll also talk a little bit about mixing techniques um, to improve game board feedback and then uh, uh, noise to the far end of a conference just optimizing the best um, signal chain. So talk about mixers, auto mixer types, and get in a little bit of on that. And then we'll touch a little bit on filters and dynamics uh, and then some of the equalization for signals. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of touch on that and uh, based on time, we may um, jump past that and just barely touch on that. Um, 
and maybe cover that in a further deep dive on DSP blocks. Um, and then we'll talk just briefly on system equalization. We won't get into a full um, how to EQ a large auditorium type of sound system because of that being just a, a topic in and of itself. But in rooms, um, we also, um, smaller conference rooms may, may need a little bit of room equalization. So we'll just touch on that topic a little bit and uh, make sure that we've got that covered. And then we will also just look at a special use case mix minus and just uh, look at some brief graphics on that to see um, kind of how to design a mix minus design. So um, all the topics um, that we kind of talk about in high level view in this um, in this portion are all available um, in more deep dive on Cornerstone. So, um, you know, I've got some links in some of these slides that will link you to some pages that kind of dive into some of these topics deeper. But um, our hope is to kind of do some more US webinars that dive into these um, already deeper, um, you know, and, and a gain structure, a DSP blocks, so maybe one on mix minus and one, one on uh, auto mix or so deep dive on each one of these topics. So this is kind of meant to be a high level view. Um, some of the gotchas that you kind of find um, in uh, deploying your conference room design. So let's go move on. First topic here, we'll kind of go right to gain structure. So as I, as I mentioned before, the Arguably, the, the most important part inside the DSP um, is getting the gain right. Um, so what is proper gain structure? So um, maybe, generally speaking, maybe proper gain structure could be looked at as establishing and maintaining good signal strength throughout the entire path. So from the front end um, where the, the microphone or the program source or the VTC uh, VoIP input carries through the signal chain in the DSP, and maintains its way through the outputs that then feed uh, VoIP transmit or VTC feed or room speaker system and, and how that is maintained throughout. And um, without good gain structure, it's kind of difficult to overall to get a good quality out of the full project. So it'll always be needed. Um, we always have to go in there and apply gain to fit the, the space. So uh, it's probably gain structure and the room acoustics are the top two um, parts of um, when, we're, when we're looking at the design. So the proper gain structure will ensure a couple of things here. Uh, it'll ensure the system is going to sound good. Like we said, we want to get the best quality as we can and we'll have enough level. So we're going to feed enough level to all of the things that need to hear microphones and program sources. Um, we'll, we'll get enough level out all our outputs. We plan accordingly in the DSP to accommodate these things. And then also we'll have minimum noise. So what we want to do is get as good a signal as we can from our real sources and we want to minimize any background noise um, so that we're not distracting with noise. So um, just a quick, um, you guys all know this, but um, just kind of a quick overview of what gain that would generally talking about the amplification or increase in voltage of electrical signal. It and can also be looked at as digital gain. Um, so we'll look at uh, input gain, um, output gain on the the analog portion, and then there's also digital gain. So, but in general, increase of voltage um, and management of that voltage throughout the signal chain. And then the structure, um, that's kind of applies to how the pass the signal is passing through the different gate stages. So um, back in older systems, you would have, you know, mic preamps, and then you would pass through different stages of outboard equipment. Um, and the same kind of applies here. We want to make sure to take care to properly pass the signal in strong into the DSP and then as it makes its way through all the different processing blocks that we may use in the DSP before it goes out the analog output or any digital outputs, we want to maintain um, good quality and integrity throughout. Um, and it's also important um, gain structure because a lot of things within the DSP um, are reliant on good gain structure. So um, there's a lot of components within the DSP, auto mixers, um, Duckers, levelers, compressors, acoustic echo canceling, those are all dependent on, they need to get good gain structure on the front end for them to work at their optimum level. So if we're starving them of signal on the front end, um, we're going to cause them to not operate at the, at the level they need to, and then it's going to cause us some problems after the fact downstream from those. So um, it's always important to just start at the front, um, go Generally, in my mind, I think left to right in the signal flow. So I'm kind of looking at the input, get it strong, going into the input, and then go through the output. So just a quick overview on audio signals, um, just so we can review. This is 
just pulled from a gain structure webinar and we just pulled a few slides here so that I can show this a little bit. So just wanted to kind of show the noise floor in the space. So um, in this case, our noise floor, then this might be room noise or the operating noise of devices. So this might be, if we're looking at a microphone, this just might be the overall um, noise in the microphone. And then in any of our DSPs, we have our clipping level. So that would be our top end where we're getting into distortion. And then in the middle here, we've kind of got our signal and where it's operating. So as we go through the, to look at the uh, signal to noise ratio, we've got our lowest point of our operating signal versus our noise floor that will give us our signal to noise ratio. And then our dynamic range is kind of defined as the top peak and the lowest valley of, of our operating speech or any program audio the inputs that's going on in there. So we want to look at that as the dynamic range. And then anything above there is where we're planning for headroom. So that's giving us a little bit of operating headroom that if something does come in, we've got a little bit of play in there before we hit a clipping level. And then what we're kind of generally looking at as we're bringing in the signal into the system is we're kind of looking to hit our operating level. So we're managing the signal to kind of get a happy medium where we're averaging around zero dBU on our meters. So we want to make sure that we have enough signal range uh, remaining above the RMS signal to not clip, but then we also want to go, we don't want to be in, coming in too low to then keep us from uh, having a good signal to noise ratio. So we want this to be as far a distance as we can get to keep that signal to noise ratio high, but we also don't want to get into clipping. So just that quick overview on that, um, don't want to get too deep into that. We've kind of talked through just a quick typical gain stage walk through. Um, as you guys probably know, we're just going to look at it as mic level. Um, signal coming in very low, um, extremely low voltage coming in on that um, voice coil of the microphone. And then uh, the advantage to that is we can run long distances. Um, but then we need to hit a preamp. Uh, we need to bring that up. Um, and arguably, that's uh, the biggest step in the system here as we, we bring it from mic, mic level to line level. And then uh, we can also look at it as uh, some, some of our sources are going to come in via line level and might need small small jumps in the amplification. So it's um, it's kind of good to look at it along those lines. But uh, in some of the DSP, we're bringing it up to line level and kind of operating within the DSP along the lines of long line level once we brought it up to line level voltage. So we're processing it within the DSP at that line level. And then as it reaches the amplifier, we're going out the um, speaker level increasing the voltages um, to 100 plus volts as it hits speaker level then outbound. So I always look at it from left to right, whether this be mic level or line level inputs, kind of maintaining in the center section unity as close to unity. Obviously, there's going to be some level controls in there, but um, we want to um, maximize our signal to noise ratio. We want to allow for adequate headroom. As we spoke of headroom, we don't want to clip our inputs. We generally want to look for a nominal zero dBU level on our inputs. So we want to try to average around zero dBU in our meters. And as I said, meters are essential. So it's important to place meters kind of throughout the processing file. Generally, I, I, I try to put them on the front end um, to watch our inputs and then at some strategic points along the way based on what the file structure is. Um, where, where I might put them uh, to watch it after an auto mixer so I can see how, how the applied gain is changing to kind of see where things were um, on the output side and any output feeds so that you can kind of manage and see where things are going along the way. And a question real quick about phone level. Generally, um, we're also kind of shooting for the same thing where the phone level um, coming in on the analog telco or a um, VoIP line is generally going to average around zero. But there is at times where I've had to reduce that um, uh, due to some overdriving. So generally, I'm also putting a meter, uh, a peak meter on that input to uh, monitor that. So we also want to have that come in around zero um, due to the AEC. So we, we definitely on the phone level want to make make provisions to get a ground zero averaging zero dB on our meters to uh, properly give the AEC processor um, 
proper level. So that's uh, on the phone level question that was asked. Uh, we also want to kind of look along those lines. So just a quick look at um, the portions of the DSP. So we're kind of looking in the DSP um, at the, what parts are analog and what parts are digital gain. Um, so as, as we see, everything in the, in the blue box here is digital gain. So that would represent, and these, and these blocks are level ends that are here and the level outs as well as any level controls that are done within the DSP, those are all digital gains. So um, analog gains are on the front end. Um, this is kind of showing an Audio input block, but the, um, I'll show uh, Tessera input blocks just for reference in the, in the next slide, um, just so you have it as a reference. Um, and then the analog gain staging on the back side of any analog output. So um, on typical input or output blocks, we've got the ability to ramp up input gain op amps and then on the back side to rep, uh, regulate voltage coming out on the outbound. So anything in, in between is digital and just as a note there, um, BIAMP references digital clipping is um, 0 dB FS full scale. So that would be where we clip at 24 dB. So we want to stay away from that. We want to operate in the around zero and then give ourselves the headroom before it gets, um, gets to that point. So just a quick look at the analog gain stage um, of the input blocks. Um, we've got an adjustment available to us of 0 to 48 dB gain um, with analog gain in the front end and then digital gain available to us here if we need to compensate. Um, we want to adjust the analog input gain accordingly. Um, knowing our sources, um, it's important to know what we're working with. So if we're working with VTC system, we want to know what its output level is. We want to know if it's sending us line level, if it's sending us a hot line level. But so depending on what we're working with, we might want to know that. We want to know our microphones um, and what their sensitivity is. So as moving on to there, uh, and this is showing a Tessera block showing the input gain analog portion and digital gain. So it's important to, to not go in and adjust this super low and then try to make up for this in uh, in the digital gain, because what we essentially will do is take a snapshot of the signal noise ratio and then raise that, which would essentially raise the noise floor below it. So a quick uh, note on uh, microphone sensitivity. I won't get into this super deep because it's um, got its own article um, in Cornerstone that I would recommend. But it's good to look at your microphone sensitivity, uh, which is uh, included in in the uh, microphone product data sheets usually. And so usually what we will do is um, if we're troubleshooting a problem, we'll we'll take a look at that and see see what the sensitivity of a microphone. If we've got a call that we're working a troubleshooting call, um, and we we look at the input gain and it looks a little bit out of the ordinary, a lot of times we'll take a look at the the reference um, material for that microphone and then see if we're actually giving it enough gain to work at its proper signal to noise ratio. So um, it's good to reference that. Um, I use a um, a link here. Um, with a calculator, usually uh, what I'll do is take and uh, use the uh, the reference materials in the data sheet, and then that will tell me what I need to be at on, on my input gain. Generally, get me in the ballpark with my input gain. It'll get me kind of close. You can always eyeball it and uh, you know use your meters to get where you need to be, but it's sometimes good to get a starting point by using the calculator. So that's a good source. Um, I, I usually go to that when I'm kind of getting to that point where I need to troubleshoot and find out what what I need to be at on a microphone. So, um, and then there's also a, a Cornerstone article that goes into micro, microphone sensitivity that goes in a little bit more detail. Um, and it's, it's a good kind of offline reading that you can go into and, and take a look at. It's got a lot of calculations and, and whys behind um, microphone sensitivity. So I wanted to throw that in there so that you could link to that and look at it offline. So um, as we move um, from the analog input gain stages, let's take a quick look at the analog output gain stages, which is something that sometimes gets forgotten um, because it's um, not necessarily going to keep you from having audio coming out of your system, but um, it's good to, to know what the full scale output means on our output blocks. So um, essentially what, what it does is the inverse of what, what's going on in the input stage. We're we're actually regulating the voltage that's coming out and supplied at that analog out output. It defaults to 24 full scale dBU. And so what, what it'll do is um, typically that is okay, but um, a lot of times you'll want to plan to match that with if you're feeding an amplifier or again, knowing your sources, knowing your destinations in this case. So knowing what, what the next 
um, device in your path is and what its sensitivity is so that we don't clip its front input. So as we look at that, um, I threw out the values of the um, voltage as it relates to each one of these full scales. So we've got um, fixed settings, six um, different settings that we can set on those full scale outputs. And as I mentioned, those default to 24 dBU, which is going to feed 12.23 volts RMS out. Um, so if you had an amplifier that peaked at a lower level of that, you might be overdriving the input of the amplifier with that setting. And uh, one of the, a common thing that we see is where uh, BTC feeds might be expecting line level voltage of maybe a setting of zero feeding line level, and we might be feeding either set at 24 or possibly one of these other values, and we're essentially overdriving the front end of a VTC or a recording device and then causing some of the activity within that device to not work as, as planned. So some of those devices have their own AGC um, gain control and what that will yield is some improper results and, and some of the uh, performance of the system. So it's good to note this and plan accordingly um, with your amplifier settings or line level outputs. And in this case, in the lowest setting, negative 31, this would actually be sending out mic level to the next device. So typically you would see that if um, you were use, using a video conferencing unit that wanted to see a mic microphone level signal, we would want to set that to 31. So it's, a, it's kind of an output um, gain thing that doesn't often get looked at, but um, it's good to know what it, what it does. Um, there is an article again that goes into this in more detail, but I wanted to hit the high level on this and kind of show you what these values are and just so that you're aware of it and, and how it can affect the performance. So and I just kind of threw that in showing again, which part is the analog gain, which one is digital gain, because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion on that um, as to which one does what. So just a quick, I know everybody has a little bit different way that they like to set gain structure. We've got a little bit of a, just a quick overview of some suggestions and best practices. Um, it's always good to start with reducing amplified outputs. Um, start start from the, follow the signal path through the chain, start from the inputs and then work its way through the output. So start with your amplified outputs down and then start working through your microphone gain structure, follow the signal path through the file, bring in any program sources and also in those cases, phone, phone inputs or VTC sources, adjust the gain as necessary, kind of get that up to operating level as soon as possible. So getting the gain right on the front end and then letting that pass through um, through the signal. Make sure everything's routed to the right outputs uh, and then slowly raise the amplifier output till you've got the level that you're looking for in the room. So, um, and again, match the full scale output on the DSP to the sen sensitivity of the amplifier so that um, you can achieve kind of your overall room volume. So if you're shooting for a total overall level in the room, you might go in there and get your inputs amplified to 75 dB and that's your what you're trying to match max level in the room and so you can bring up your your amplifier to get you to that level another option that you could do is to use pink noise generator inside of the dsp and you could kind of get a starting level on your amplifier and then start working um, after you've made some adjustments and uh, get your desired spl level at, at your speaker zone location so it's good to that's another way that you can do it if you want to start with sending a tone um, just take into account if you're sending a tone um, that they're there's a, a bit of a crest factor. So um, if you're sending like a pink noise, uh, kind of make sure that you're you're averaging that using the, uh, the crest factor of the sources. And also just as a note, as you're getting to zero dB um, on the inputs, um, ceiling microphones perform a little different than other microphones. And, and generally what I would suggest in ceiling microphones is that you may not be able to get it averaging above zero um, and getting the best signal to noise ratio. Just overall, just depending on the distance of the, the closest talker to the, to the ceiling microphone. So those are a little bit of an exception when you're metering, you may not be able to get where you're averaging above zero on your peaks in those cases. What, what you might find is if you start adding more gain, you're getting more room noise. So that is a little bit of an exception uh, of those versus other sources. and. Um, that's just a note, a side note on that. So just a quick review. We already looked at this 
graphic, but let's just kind of look at um, a, a quick overview of looking at a signal coming from a microphone and say we're producing 70 dB SPL at the microphone and we've checked the microphone sensitivity. We've seen that it's requiring 48 dB of preamp gain to get it up to operating level. So we've given that at the input gain stage. We're following throughout at unity gain through the processor or giving small adjustments and some level control blocks. I, I, in, in the file, obviously, if you've got live sound reinforcement, you're gonna want to give some user control, but what you'll wanna do is um, kind of as a good rule of thumb is to give some operating top and bottom end limits so you don't give the user control to, to take it from plus 12 to negative 60 dB. You might give them a small range that you give them um, control of those microphones, and that way you're still maintaining somewhat of a unity gain within the processor that you can then drive out to the speaker. So in this case, if we had a set to full-scale output, we may then be supplying to an amplifier that produces 30 watts with a sensitivity of zero dBU. So if we give it full full scale output of 24, we may in this case with a speaker that's got a fairly decent sensitivity, we may be producing if we were at full scale um, 92 dB in the room, which might be too much for this room. We may be only trying to get between 85 and 90 at most in this room for our reinforcement. So there's a couple of places where we would what we could go and reduce this. What we wouldn't want to do is go to the mic preamp. So we'd turn this up. And then if we reduce this gain, obviously we would then cause other things in between here to not operate at the proper voltage. So what we would recommend uh, is either limiting the full scale here, use this as your kind of master volume to dictate how much is getting to your amplifier, or you could use your amplifier control attenuator to then adjust that. The only downside to that is if those attenuators were available to someone, the end user, there's a possibility that someone at, at some point in time could turn up the amplifier and get your gain staging wrong. So sometimes it's uh, a good idea to go ahead and just leave the amplifier attenuators fully on, and then maybe make your full scale output adjustments in the in the DSP and that way it's locked down within the DSP and um, only only uh, people that have access to the DSP can make these changes so um, that's just some suggestions on how to reduce the overall and and where it flows here through the signal so a quick word on uh, what meters to use um, so uh, there's a lot of different opinions and different people have their favorites and it's totally cool to have your own favorite and what works for you and what you're used to. Um, just wanted to kind of have a couple of suggestions. Obviously you want to consider what you're looking for, uh, the type of signal and what point in the si system that it's being monitored at. So in general, the peak meter is going to be an instantaneous level of an audio signal um, related to its voltage. So it's proportional to the voltage of the audio signal. So a lot of times I like to use, and just as a personal preference, the peak meter on the front end um, to monitor my inputs just to make sure that I'm um, not peaking and overdriving the input gain stage. And then um, typically I'll then move to RMS meters throughout the rest of the signal chain and then use those to give me more of an average. So the um, kind of the peak meter is going to watch more of the clipping. So that, again, that's why I would kind of look at that more of uh, where I would use that would be on the front end and then kind of more of an average signal throughout the, the signal chain, that might be where I'd use an RMS meter. Um, so whichever one you like to use, in the end, it's gonna be your personal preference, but um, kind of knowing how, how they work and uh, best ones to use in the different, uh, is, can be sometimes just trial and error. You get used to the ones that you're used to what, uh, how they behave. Um, we offer both in our, um, in our DSP, so, um, uh, definitely experiment and see which ones that you work with. Oh, and uh, I got a quick question I wanted to get to. Um, so the um, question was uh, in related to uh, turning down the analog output and then working with like the digital versus the analog output. In general, what we would try to do is start with the analog output and make those adjustments. And then what I try to do with the digital output, if I do need to do it, uh, is to use it to make fine tune adjustments. Uh, and, and kind of the same thing on the input. Um, there are sometimes that you have a microphone that um, 48 dB a gain is just a little too much. And since our um, input gain stage and output gain stages make those jumps at you know six dB jumps, 
Um, sometimes small adjustments, I kind of look at it as a fine grain um, adjustment. I, I sometimes maybe have a microphone that comes in at 48 dB and I want to adjust it just a little bit down. I would aim for shooting for 8, 48 dB and then make my adjustment in the digital gain to turn it down just a little bit. And kind of the same thing would apply on the output uh, in, in relation to the question of turning down the analog output. I'd get it as close as I could to the analog output to match the amp, but if I needed to make small adjustments down, I would make that, I could make that at the digital output. Uh, and generally what I would want to do is try to make adjustments down and not so much um, gain up adjustments from the digital gain in most, in most cases. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, if there's any further detail, we can, we can talk offline on that if you want. Um, and then back to the RMS and uh, peak meters. I just wanted to mention that there's also a cornerstone article that goes into detail a little bit more on those. Um, to read offline. Uh, so you can kind of dig into that and see which ones fit. But from from my perspective, where I've where I've got the best use out of the meters is just trial and error, seeing what I like and then get used to uh, you get used to what you're looking for. So depending on the source, depending on the type. Um, so so moving on from gain structure. So as we kind of talked about, um, that's a big topic. It needs to in general, um, the gain structure section can be taught in an hour on its own and even could be a more detailed um you know webinar so i, I assume we'll probably what we're going to do is do another webinar that's going to dig more into gain structure to kind of dig in deeper there are some articles on cornerstone that go into um, gain structure overall uh, input and output levels i would recommend uh, researching those if you have further questions until you see the next webinar come along for gain structure. So moving on to the next portion, let's uh, just talk uh, about auto mixers and uh, I want to make sure that we get through this fairly quick. We're about half an hour into it. So um, we're going to run through um, auto mixing techniques within the DSP and what types to use and what the best sort of advantage that each ones are going to give you. So and generally what we're going to try to do is look at who needs to hear who and how it's being lifted. If it's being lifted in the room, if it's being sent to the far end of a conference, um, how we're going to mix it. So just kind of look at a quick overview of a standard mixer. Uh, we have these type of mixer blocks in our DSP. This is just a basic mixer and uh, why, you know, what, what, what a design would look like without an auto mixer in place. So this is kind of showing, in this case, a voice lift scenario where we've got um, three sources coming into a ceiling speaker. And so what um, some of the things that we could run into in this case would be uh, maybe a poor signal to noise ratio. Um, all those microphones are live. We don't have really an operator that's turning those up and down. Those are just kind of set to a set, certain level and just left open. So if those microphones didn't have a push to talk or something like that, then um, those could be just operating and just live to the, the ceiling speaker, so we don't really have anything in place to manage that signal. Um, another thing that could do is uh, we could have poor gain before feedback because um, we obviously have three microphones open and one microphone uh, could pick up the source that's being lifted and then picked up in another mic. So we do have the potential for feedback loops in this kind of scenario. And then we also do have the, the potential uh, multiple microphones picking up the multipath. So if these guys are sitting close together around a, a conference table, we have the p potential that if I talk into mic, mic two, that microphone one may pick me up a little bit. And since there's no management in place, that signal could be going to the ceiling speakers as well, causing a little bit of comb filtering and phasing that uh, could also translate to the far end of a call. This In this scenario, we're talking about uh, voice lift, but this could all uh, be the same kind of behavior if we're talking a conferencing scenario. So uh, Another thing to take into consideration is uh, it's kind of our doubling of the microphones. So the more microphones we introduce, we're going to start um, on a traditional mix, or we're going to start bringing up the output gain above unity. So in the case where we might have one microphone, we might be okay. We're coming in unity gain. We've set the input gain stage, and we're coming in unity, and we're everything is good. And then we add another microphone to the mix, and then we've then uh, – brought up the unity gain up, so we're, we're adding gain. And as we go along the line, if we had four microphones, then we've brought up the unity by 6 dB. So we don't really have anything to manage the unity gain in a typical traditional mixer uh, scenario. It's just adding each one of those microphones, and the more we add, the more unity gain brings up. So we could combat this by reducing the gain on the output to compensate. Um, that's that's a way we could do. Uh, we could bring down the each microphone's input to, you know, manage that, but then we might suffer some um, gain 
problems and just not enough gain uh, in the system. Or we could use an automatic mixer uh, in this case. So, um, so showing the same diagram, we'll just add in an auto mixer in there. We, so we've got an algorithm in there. We've got an intelligent auto mixer that's going to kind of manage everything um, at this point now. So this, this auto mixer is going to act as our kind of virtual sound guy that's in there, in there that's watching our signal. He's going to try to get us as close to unity gain on the output as possible. And then he's also going to try to manage how many mics are open at any given time. So he might be muting the microphones. We may tell him we want uh, to have certain nom values. So some of the advantage, we've got uh, now optimized signal to noise ratio. So we're in attenuating if we've um, set it up, we've, we've attenuated some of the background noise, um, some of the gain on the other microphones. So we, uh, if we've, we've we set some non values, we've now brought back the number of open mics. So we've attenuated those signals and then we've also reduced the cone filtering. So we've got a higher gain before feedback total in this system scenario. So let's talk about each type real quick. Um, kind of already talked about that. So we've got two main types in our, in our software available. Um, in, uh, if you're working in Audio or Nexia, um, gating auto mixers are the only auto mixers available. Just, just a side note, um, in Tessera, um, we, we both have gating and gain sharing auto mixers available. So just quick overview on uh, gating auto mixers. So we just kind of want to talk about that it's gating on and off or reducing the level of the microphone. So we've got non values. We can um, set it up to allow a certain amount of microphones through and then microphones that are not in use or above or below threshold are going to be gated on and off. And we can manage that um, by settings in, in the microphone as to how many microphones we want to have on and off and how we want them to behave. And also the output level in a gating auto mixer is going to be adjusted to the number of over microphones. So it's going to maintain unity gain on the output and, and manage that as, as a almost like a virtual sound man inside of the microphone uh, mixer that's going to manage things. So just we'll look at a quick graphic on that. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll fly through this fairly quick. But The threshold um, is going to be set by the microphone. So the microphone inputs that are fed to the gating auto mixer are going to it's going to look out there as as the room um, background noise, and it's going to set a threshold. And as long as any one of our microphones are below that threshold, they're going to be gated off. So we're not going to have any excess noise to the far end. Um, it's going to keep all of that quiet. We get a microphone, then I speak into a microphone, and I exceed that threshold. Then I get gated on, and I, I'm sent to the far end. So then I'm sent out at unity gain. Another microphone speaks, and I've got a nom value of two set in my settings, and I'm uh, going to allow more than one microphone. Then it's going to let the secondary microphone through as well, still giving me unity gain on the output. As that microphone falls back below the threshold, um, it's going to gate it back off. I get still a clean signal. Any background noise that that microphone was picking up is then gone. If the noise floor in the room were to change, our adaptive algorithm is going to change the threshold to match with the the noise floor in the room. So the threshold is going to always be adaptive. It's not something that you can set in the block to, to a fixed level. There's some, some ways that you can kind of work with it uh, by using some microphone settings. But in general, it's going to be an adaptive threshold. And you want it to be that because you want it to perform differently if, if an air handler comes on or off. You want it to, to behave uh, properly and always gate off and, and watch for the right things. And again, another microphone gate set the new threshold above this level, then we get let in by unity gain. So a couple of pros and cons on each. Um, so we've got the ability in a gating auto mixer to limit the, the number of open microphones so we can reduce background noise. Um, we can set that in the auto mixer settings. Um, some pros, we got fast response. Um, can uh, do a direct outputs on those outputs um, to to then manage for mix minus so that we can reduce the amount of open microphones that are feeding to zone. So if we've got potential of, of voice lift scenarios where we might have um, feedback, we've got the ability to kind of dictate the microphones being on or off to help with that. Um, some cons, uh, background noise can 
level can change as the microphone gates on and off, so it can be an audible, um, an audible change. So it, it might be heard on the far end more, uh, more prevalent on that far end uh, of the background noise as it's gating on and off. Um, so um, if they go kind of showing it on the unnatural silence at the far end, uh, as it states there. Um, Sometimes the, if it's got improper gain structure, we can kind of hear a little bit of a pumping sound or breathing sound. And then sometimes improper settings can cause some uh, kind of loss of the first bits of speech. So usually that's, that's um, seen where if there's not enough input gain at the first gain stage, then sometimes the, the getting on mixer won't get enough signal at the front of the syllables um, to, to then um, trigger it to open. All right, and uh, let me move on to gain sharing auto mixers. Francis, I'll, um, uh, Francis got a, had a question about the chairman override and uh, in relation to the Tessera. And uh, what I may do is hit that at the end. And um, the way that I understand it is the chairman override should work the same in Tessera as audio. Um, so the question was related to uh, chairman override in the audio series working uh, properly, but then having some issues in uh, Tessera. Um, so I'll, I'll look into that. I may that may be one that I'll test offline and then get back to uh, Francis on the on the question. But we'll hit that at the end um, after I get through here and uh, see if we can check it out. But the performance should be the same. Uh, I would I would think in, in to Sarah. So back to uh, gain sharing auto mixer. So a little bit different approach. Um, it's our, our gain sharing auto mixer into Sarah is um, based on the the Dan Dugan design. So we're kind of following along those lines. Um, so the operation of the gain sharing auto mixer is a little different um, approach than the gating auto mixer. Um, it's going to share the gain across all of the channels. So um, the act active channels will will pull gain away from non-active channels to share a total of 100% gain. So um, it's it has a little bit of different approach where where it's pulling away. So I want to show a kind of a graphic of that um, to kind of show the way it operates in a more graphical state here. So if we have two microphones connected to the gain sharing auto mixer um, and uh, none of them are being used, they're just sitting idle, they, they would start out receiving the same amount of gain. So we'd be at 50%. And then if I were to then speak and I was the only person speaking, I would be given proportionally enough gain to get myself up to unity some total between would be 100 percent if no no other person was speaking and it was very quiet room i might get 100 percent of the, the available gain if there was still a little bit of background noise that it was trying to amplify i may still see a little bit of gain applied to the second microphone and not be given 100 percent at my primary total 100 percent available so if, then if we add more microphones to the system, the, uh, the view is the same, but as we add more microphones, the amount of gain per microphone to start with in its idle state is going to be less because we're getting proportionally spread across there to give us total um, of 100%. So in this case, each microphone has been given a little bit less to start with, but again, as a microphone goes live, it is given gain. but not given as much because there's still gain shared amongst the other microphones. So there's always going to be a little gain that's shared amongst the other microphones. Um, so some pros and cons um, on the gain sharing auto mixer. Um, the noise level remains constant because there's always microphones open. There's not any gating on and off. There's always going to be some room noise. Um, Good thing is uh, there's going to be a little bit easier transition from one mic to the other for uh, like moving sources. So if you've got table mics and someone's going to be moving around, that might be a good option. Um, and it's uh, good for recording broadcasts and live applications uh, because of its uh, behavior. It kind of acts very, very smooth as it transitions. A few cons, um, larger size gain sharing auto mixers 
may not provide enough gain to the active channel. We do have a setting um, that can be changed to compensate for that. It's a microphone isolation factor, so you can make that adjustment and it will compensate for larger mixers. But sometimes what I will do is if it gets beyond a certain amount of inputs and we see that the available gain to uh, live microphones that are not enough, sometimes we will break those um, gain sharing auto mixers up in the file to um, to compensate for that. And sometimes what I'll approach is um, look at look at it as um, types. So if I've got table microphones that are of all of one type, I might put those all in a gain sharing auto mixer, and then I might also treat um, wireless microphones differently. I might put them on their own gain sharing auto mixer um, to then allow them to work as a team. Um, there are some cases where we've um, used, utilized gain sharing in addition to gating auto mixers, so kind of a combination of both, whatever works um, you know, to, to solve some problems. So it's kind of nice to, uh, in some cases, if you've got a tri-element mic, you might want to run the tri-elements through a gain sharing auto mixer and allow those work as a team and, and then run multiples of those through gating auto mixers. So that might be a use case application where you might use both. Um, so it, it's... It's good to kind of experiment, and as you get used to certain types of microphones that you use um, often in your designs, there's there's quite often you find that you you see certain types of microphones work better with one versus the other, and then you kind of plan your DSPs accordingly to accommodate that. So a few auto mixer do's and don'ts as it applies to both um, types. Um, all auto mixers work on the input level, so again. I'm uh, pushing the gain structure real hard today, but uh, this, uh, the uh, auto mixers, we, we want to make sure that the, the gain structure ahead of the auto mixer is proper so that it can work. Um, we don't want to starve it of level um, so that it uh, works properly. So both the gain and uh, gate, gating and gain sharing are ideal for voice applications. Um, they, they've, uh, where you've got distant conferencing and meeting rooms, training rooms. Um, In general, gating auto mixers don't work as well for live sound reinforcement. Now, the exception to that might be if you're using a gating auto mixer in a mix minus type scenario where you're you're managing that with direct outs and, and then you're feeding it and planning it to certain zones. Um, that might not be as noticeable, but what we don't want to have is abrupt stops and starts on, on syllables. So uh, generally, gain sharing auto mixers can be better for that application for music and live sound. So you might um, even experiment where you, in your file, if you have um, live sound reinforcement and you're also doing conferencing, um, you could you know, you know, could set it up to where your signal is split and then you're handling your live lifted sound through a gain sharing auto mixer and then handling your conferencing portion of the gating. Uh, that's an, another way that you could use that. Um, And as a good note, um, just a good general best practice, uh, the microphone level control, we like to do it after the auto mixer. So come in, um, in general, come in, hit the gain stage, any AEC processing or other processing, um, hit the uh, mixers and then do level controls after. So if you needed to do individual level controls um, on individual mics, it might be good to still put those controls after the auto mixer because we don't want to limit the input, um, the input gain settings. All right, so we got about 12 minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just hit a couple of more topics real quick here, um, and I'm just gonna put in a plug for our AEC here. Um, AEC is really important. It's a topic that is deep dive and it, it got its own webinar. So in December, Jason did a webinar on the AEC and we did an hour on AEC. So just wanted to touch on this, but I would encourage you to take a look at that recorded webinar and uh, that goes into deep dive on AEC, but it's very important in conferencing applications and that will allow us to get into a deep dive. So just a few top, uh, top level looks on the, the AEC. We've got AEC included on in our software to allow for acoustic echo canceling. We've got AGC available um, on each one of our AC blocks. Um, we've got speech sense technology in our AGC blocks, which allows us to focus in on speech sources and um, not um, zero in on sources that we don't want to do AGC on. Um, 
and the digs deeper into it on the AEC webinar. Um, again, that's that's going to be a good one to just look at on its own. So we'll move on from that, and I just want to take a quick quick look at some some blocks. Uh, we'll, I think what we're going to do is dig deep dive into some of these topics with some of our blocks and what they do in another webinar. That way we can spend a little bit more time. AGC is a topic that we could really get into and talk for an hour on if we wanted to and do some demos of, of actually AGC performing its uh, function. So I just wanted to touch on this because it's important um, to set this right. So AGC um, is available in the AEC block. It's also available as a standalone block. So in most cases, you're going to use the AGC that's in the AEC processing block. One of the exceptions to that would be if you're using our um, TCM1 microphones. If you've ever used those, you'll see that um, when you bring in the AEC block for beam tracking microphones, it would uh, disable AGC and the AEC processing block. And the reason for that would be in our processing block library for the TCM1 blocks, we actually add the AGC um, standalone block at the back end um, to allow the proper handoff between mics and multiple mic systems. So the, in, that would be an exception to a typical rule of putting the AGC ahead of um, in the AEC processing is generally um, where it's placed in the signal chain. Tar targets and subtracts gains as necessary. So we're making a target level available here in the input and then input level is adjusted applied gain is given um, to to the signal to to try to average around the target level so what we're trying to do is uh, make adjustments to the signal to get us to that level and then we've got some settings here to give our maximum gain and minimum gain and the adjustment rates related to that so it can ramp up at a fast rate or slow rate depending on how you want to set it up And it does also include our speech sense algorithm, which would focus in on speech only sources. So it's not going to try to ramp up um, audio on a door closing or someone ruffling pap papers on a, someone typing on a laptop. Um, oh, a quick uh, question about the AEC webinar. It, it is um, on the BIAMP YouTube channel. That's where um, I found it. it. It doesn't link to it from the support site or the main BIAMP site, I believe. Um, I, I've gone to the YouTube channel and then uh, typed in the AEC, and it should be one of the most recently post, posted ones, along with the design and conference room one for you, Bob. So quickly, I'm going to just hop through just some other things to, to look at. And uh, again, these are some topics that we want to go into more deep dive um, on, on a DSB Blocks webinar. But um, some of you folks that have gone through some of the Tessera classes probably are familiar with some of these slides. And so um, we've got filters available to us. I just wanted to show kind of the use of those filters. We can use filters as standalone blocks within the file, but we also um, can use utilize some of the filters that are in some of the blocks. Um, AEC um, blocks have, have their own high pass filter, which we generally recommend to use because um, it, it and I'll show that in a moment. But generally, we're looking at uh, managing the signal. Uh, what we don't want to do is make too much alterations. Generally, on a conferencing signal, we want to just eliminate the things that we don't want, like pop sounds, uh, plosives, uh, maybe low-frequency vibrations, um, air handlers. A lot of times, um, air handlers can be corrected um, by just applying high-pass filtering and maybe not getting as aggressive with noise reduction in the AEC processing block, you might be able to stay with a medium noise reduction setting and then clean up some of air handler noise or just general noise by using high pass filters. Um, maybe some hum picked up on the electrical or line and high frequency noise. So I wanted to show um, the AEC um, and where it's located in the AEC processing block. So generally we like to use the high pass filter um, in this block. And uh, the way I like to use it is that I like to apply high pass filtering within the AEC block because of cleaning up the signal. Um, generally, the ref is referencing the signal here. Um, so that's where the algorithm for the AEC subtraction um, is being done, is, is referencing the signal when, when it is here in the signal chain. So if we apply a high pass filter after the AEC processing block. In general, what we're doing is we're giving the AEC algorithm the full breadth of the signal to work off of, and it may work 
fine, but it, in some troublesome rooms, it may not work to its um, to its optimum level. So um, what we like to do is make those cuts, use the high pass filter in the AEC processing block if possible, and and then um, that frees up a little bit of DSP power because you're already you're already using it here, and then maybe make some sweetening changes. Um, downstream if you need to sweeten mics for the live sound. You, usually what we're trying to do in a conferencing scenario is get the microphone clean, use its baseline, good qualities, and then maybe only do EQ on the microphone for corrective EQ in the room in some case. So, And just a quick note on compression. Um, we've got a couple of different types of compression available. We've got levelers and some compressors. Um, I'm just showing for reference. Uh, from our library related to the MXA910, we've got the ability to do some compression and kind of a specialty compressor. I wanted to show that on this one because we use this in some cases. I know there's a lot of, of those deployments. Um, and this is a dual knee compressor where we're compressing the top end, but we are also have a second knee that acts as a downward expansion. Um, so we're kind of doing a little bit of noise uh, reduction, almost acting as a bit of a noise gate in this, um, in this case. And then just a quick note, um, I know in larger rooms, a lot of folks uh, are doing a lot of corrective EQ, but um, even in smaller rooms, uh, I like to recommend doing a bit of room uh, EQ. And uh, so it's just important to use your ears. If the room sounds good, if the speakers sound good, it's probably fine. You can just kind of leave it um, and you know not do some major adjustments. What we don't want to do is you know do major corrective adjustments if we don't need to. but if we have a room and we're using our RTA and we see some kind of spikes along the way, it's it's nice to use like a parametric or something simple on the back end before your speaker outputs to manage those, flatten them out a little bit, and um, do some corrective EQ. And uh, and I'm sorry I didn't show this on the Uber filter. I had the question about the Uber filter. I, I wish I'd shown the Uber filter here uh, so that we had a little bit. Uh, of a graphic representation on the Uber filter. But um, in this, I'm just showing a, a typical parametric band, but kind of showing um, some a little bit of corrective EQ. Generally, what we want to do is a, a bit of subtractive EQ. We don't want to, in general, add much. We want to start at the baseline, but then that may give us a little bit more of a flat response. So that might help with a lot of things in the room. Even if you've got a room where you're not doing any voice lift, this may, if you've got some speakers that have um, nodes or anything where it's just got some high frequencies that are causing issues, maybe that could help uh, flatten in those out of speakers, might help a little, even with your AEC um, in the room. So um, we we could correct some of the, the problems that um, in the room itself by just flattening out the, the speaker response. Now, I've only got about three minutes, so I'm going to talk really quickly about mix minus. Um, and um, what I uh, wanted to mention, that we're going to have a Mix Minus article that will be posted on our design library shortly. I'm working on that now, and that will go into a little bit more detail on Mix Minus. But I kind of wanted to just talk quickly on – it's kind of a specialty case, but um, just wanted to talk about what a Mix Minus system is. Um, so generally, what we're doing is we're uh, setting up a multi-zone output that will lift sound to only certain zones. So generally, what we're doing is in a um, – in a uh, say this is a boardroom or something like that, we might be um, raising voices of certain microphones to other zones where that other end other end of the table can hear voice lift. Um, so we're kind of using it to leverage better steep intelligibility, better gain before feedback. And the kind of the way it looks on paper here is a little bit. Um, and then a small scenario, we've got a four zone type system and we've got table mics. And what what we're trying to accomplish in this case is we want to amplify certain microphones to certain zones while not sending any signal to any other zones. So what we did essentially be doing here is giving speaker zone one um, the feeds from microphones three through eight. Speaker zones two would be one and two, and then we would not lift our own microphones in those zones to those areas. So just a quick overview of the way it would look in the software. Um, Generally, what you would use is a matrix mixer, utilizing multi-zone outputs to speaker zones and then utilizing the speaker zone inputs. And then what we would want to do in this case is 
assign microphones to adjacent zones, but not to zones that are above them. And generally, what we would also want to do is recommend speakers that are in these zones that have a very tight pattern. Uh, we want to keep it right above what we want it to be on and not to anything else that we don't want it to feed to. And as a further sweetening item, um, generally what we do is do some adjustments at adjacent zones so that it's a little bit more natural as, as you listen. Um, we've got a little bit of attenuation in closer zones. That'll also help with some of the, the uh, feedback. So I talked real quick on that. I meant to spend some more time on that, but we are going to do a design library article on that. And then most likely that we could fit this into another webinar that's on its own mix minus to talk about that. But I did want to mention that because that does come up in a lot of questions. Um, so let me real quickly here um, look at C. Um, I may talk, um, the, there's a question on the Uber filter. Um, what I may do is reach out to you directly and um, just send you some resources on the Uber filter, and then we'll probably hit that on another webinar where we talk about DSB blocks. But in general, the Uber filter is got the ability to set up for parametric and high pass, low pass, high shelving, and low shelving. So it gives you all the different options within that that you can select the filter types and get um, real granular, and then you can fix those bands. So it, it kind of gives you everything available. So let me check here. Got one more question about... Uh, from Michael here, I want to make sure we get that answered. Okay, so uh, Michael had a question about just baffles and uh, base traps. That's a good question because it, I mean, it comes in, we, we face it every day with rooms that, that need that. So um, I don't know. I'm not sure if the if that's in the roadmap at all to, to do any kind of things like that. but. Um, Definitely, uh, what would be nice is if we could make, if we could even partner with somebody to make recommendations, and then we could then offer those resources on Cornerstone. That would probably be more more likely, as if we could um, kind of give a location where we could recommend um, uh, that you know baffles and and uh, treatment solutions, and maybe um, kind of push that push that um, so that it's getting to the right people. Um, feedback eliminator, uh, typically uh, what I would say on the feedback eliminator is use exper using it sparingly. I generally would only use it on uh, – um, and I, I generally wouldn't use it on a feed to a speaker zone in, in the most part. I would use, usually utilize those on particular troublesome inputs, so I would typically put that after an auto mixer and then between that and matrix mixing, um, so after uh, – on a direct out of an auto mixer, and then I would – try to in general put that after an EQ and then limit the amount of bands and then what I would use is that to define where some troublesome spots are and then make corrective EQ and the EQ that's before it in the signal chain and then allow the feedback exterminator to not have as much of a load on it um, so that hopefully that answers that a little bit we can uh, Brian we can talk that offline if, if we need to go into more detail on that. Um, mix minus with sealant microphones. Uh, that is a good question. That is doable in some cases. Um, it is takes a lot of a, a lot more time. Um, and what I found with those is if you did do that, that you need to have proper separation between zones and adjacent zones. So we're talking about in those cases um, having rooms that are larger um, and, and, and then having speaker zones that have very defined patterns to keep them. And I usually try to go over 30 feet between adjacent zones, if 30 to 40 feet in some cases to, to allow, because otherwise we don't get enough gain before feedback for it to be beneficial. Um, I have seen some and heard some rooms where um, beam forming microphones have been used successfully, but have taking, taken a lot of time and work to, to accomplish. So um, in general, if you're going to do it, it it does take a lot of time and to plan accordingly on the front end. Okay, quickly, um, webinar um, part one is uh, available through our YouTube channel. So uh, just uh, that and the AEC, you should be able to grab through the YouTube channel um, on the buy amp channel and uh, just do a search real quick and it should show up as pretty recent. Um, Brian had a question about 
pre-AEC for room sound reinforcement? So that's a good question. Uh, you kind of can do either or. It's, it's good to note that any signal that passes through an AEC processing block, even if it is being sent to live sound, it's going to encounter a bit of delay um, due, due to the processing. There'll be a bit of latency. So um, I've, I see it done both ways, and it kind of depends on the room and how critical of a listening environment it is. Um, um, a lot of times I see it going right through the AEC processing block, but then there are some times where using the signal from a mic input and bypassing the AEC for the voice lift portion and then keeping the same signal going through the AEC processing block um, to, to go to the conferencing side while uh, not applying any, uh, there's going to be a little bit of latency, but it'll be reduced if you bypass that. So um, it's kind of a user preference. Um, it's I've seen sometimes where it's acceptable, sometimes where it's completely unacceptable, uh, you know, the small amount of latency that you hear. And it is a small amount of latency. So depending on the room, the room is a reverberant room. You're probably not even going to catch that with the lifted. Um, it's it's a small amount. So we're about five minutes over. Um, Mohammed, I, I'm going to I'll reach back out to you directly on the, the compressor question. And um, I think I've got everybody else's questions somewhat. And I'll, what I'll do back is uh, reach back through. And if there's anything that I didn't get through to, I will reach back out to you individually. But thanks, uh, thanks again for attending. Hopefully, this was a little bit of help. And uh, again, we just touched on the top end of this. Um, we're going to do some more deep dives on these. Uh, an hour's uh, kind of a tough to get into each one of these super deep. So I appreciate everybody's time, and uh, I will let you all go for now and get back to your day. And uh, feel free to reach out uh, if you need to and uh, utilize Cornerstone and also our design libraries. I wanted to throw that out there at the end. Um, on our Cornerstone site, there's a design library. There's a lot of different templates that are out there that are good starting points. If you've got questions on flow and some designs, go go for it and take those on and uh, you know, use those as needed. Um, that are they're good, helpful uh, place to to kind of get started. So I'll let you get back to it. Uh, have a good rest of your day, and thank you so much for joining us. Have a good one.